Welcome to this time of worship here, uh, this Lord's Day at First Presbyterian Church. We're glad you are here with us as we worship together. Hope all of you will sign the uh, friendship pads as they make their way back and forth. This gives us a chance to know that you are here. Also, if you have some any uh, address changes or updates, and if you're visiting with us, it gives you a chance to let us know who you are uh, so that we can uh, uh, follow up with you. But again, and also let you you put names and faces together of those who are uh, sitting along the pew. Uh, I will say last Sunday I was away. Uh, Jenny and I were up in New York visiting our daughter who was doing an internship and we worshiped at a Presbyterian church, signed the friendship thing, passed it down the row, indicated that we are visitors, and nobody spoke to us. Um, I mean, we were well dressed. We looked like nice people. So this is a... Um, this is a not-so-subtle word to those members of the church here. If you're sitting down the row from someone who indicates they're a visitor, uh, don't let them get away without uh, speaking to them, without making sure they feel welcome as a, a worshiping here in the church. I want to say a, a special welcome to uh, Kimberly Moore, who's singing. It's been a couple times in the last few months that uh, it, we, it's been our pleasure to have uh, her sing for us this morning. Uh, she got, she won't want me to tell this story, she got caught in traffic on the way to the early service today, rushed in right at the nick of time, and I think without even inhaling, uh, sang her solo, and it was beautiful, but uh, I, she looks more relaxed now than she did then, but it'll be our pleasure uh, to hear her as she offers uh, her musical gift to God. If you look at the back of the bulletin, you'll see various things going on in the life of the church. Even as we speak right now, there's a blood drive that we help to sponsor going on uh, across the street at our Episcopal neighbors, the Church of the Good Shepherd. Uh, they will be going; it'll be going on till noon. Uh, I expect there's uh, room for walk-ins, as there usually are. That will be your only excuse for leaving the worship service here before noon today, is if, uh, if you're going to go over and give blood. Uh, the rest of you, I hope you'll stay till the very end. But uh, if you had meant to give blood and uh, forgot, if you want to go over there and let, let that be your act of worship today, we would understand. I hope that our young people, our high school young people, got on the bus this morning at 1030 heading for uh, Montreat. We'll keep them in uh, our prayers as they go. That's a great uh, event every year for our youth group to be a part of the, uh, one of the youth conferences at Montreat, a very special time. Let me let you know a little bit about the event that's going to be going on here from Tuesday through Friday. Uh, it says there on Tuesday, summer in the city through Friday. People, off, pe people have noticed, of course, that our young people go off to different places to do mission. They go, we've been to <laughs> Uh, Washington, Chicago, Miami, all sorts of uh, 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 various places even uh, out of the United States. Summer in the City allows some of our area middle school youth to come here as a mission site. Not only our own middle school young people, but middle school uh, kids from throughout the presbytery have been invited to come spend a few days living, uh, eating, uh, uh, sleeping in our facilities and uh, and participating in in some hands-on ministry in the downtown Raleigh area and so we are a mission site for the next couple of weeks we have one group coming in this week another group coming in next week and so it gives us a chance uh, to expose some of the kids who live in some of the outlying areas to come into the middle of the capital city and see what ways they might be um, missionaries in the Christian church in our own community. So just wanted you to know that's going on. It's a great program for the young people in the church. I'll, another uh, outlet uh, for mission is our Habitat for Humanity House continues to be under construction. Saturday work days go on until the house is complete. And if on a small, easy to uh, manage level, if you want to help us stock some of the local food pantries, we invite you to bring this month powdered milk or juice that we will use to stock uh, some of the pantries that we help uh, stock, uh, pantries that are much in demand this, these days, as you might imagine. But again, we're glad you're here with us as we worship God together. I invite you to use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of worship.
Bearish Lord Jesus, my soul's glory, joy, and crown, perfect setting for our responsive call to worship. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is our God and King. Together, let us worship God. Please be seated. In one of Ed's sermons here, he mentioned that uh, 
God encourages us to bring our sins and shortcomings to God's light. And he said, in the light of God, those failures can be faced, fixed, and forgiven. And so in our unison prayer and then in our silent personal confession, let us bring our imperfect selves into the light of God. Let us pray together. Make us worthy servants of your kingdom, O God, more inclined to serve your purposes than our own. We confess that our first inclination is to do what pleases us rather than what pleases you. We confess that the pursuit of our own joy distracts us from our highest calling, which is to worship you and to bring gladness to your heart. Forgive us for placing ourselves at the center of our concern and for edging you toward the periphery. Restore a proper order to our lives, O oh God. Draw us again to the way of Jesus, whose love for you and love for neighbor revealed the beauty you envision in a human life. By your grace, bring forth that beauty in us to the glory of your name. are we that God is mindful of us? Well, we're children of God, created in God's image, loved, redeemed, and constantly being improved by God. In Christ, we're new creations. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you have been forgiven and be at peace. <laughs>
raised by the uh, Moore family, Kimberly, and her mama Alice on sound, so make sure you can hear it. <laughs> We're graced this morning by the return of the Harris family. I would like to uh, call them forward at this time. Uh, Michael and Angela Harris are back, bringing with them Noah and Natalie. Noah and Natalie were both baptized here, but then it was kind of, they were kind of homebound there in Wake Forest with two real, real youngins, and it was kind of hard to get back to Raleigh, so they adopted a local church for a while, but now they're back at the mother church, and we're glad to have them back. Uh, Michael and Angela both worked in the youth group when they were here, and the library, and he also knows some smoke about computers, worked on our websites before. Uh, in fact, we were talking about the, our hope for years to come. They were here back when that whole process started 15 years or so ago. Have, as a, which Sunday school class won the recruiting battle for you? Was it Phoenix or Fides? Or? Oh, still the battle rate wages, okay, for the Sunday school. Um, Michael works for NetApp in technical support. It's very technical. Uh, but if you want to know about cloud infrastructure, encryption, or a secure multi-tenancy solution, Michael's your man. Angela's full-time job is tending to Noah and Natalie. Noah uh, is a rising sixth grader, and Natalie a rising third grader. They're both at Franklin Academy in Wake Forest, and school starts again this week. Boy, it's a tough academy. Their elder is uh, Beth Fields, and we hope that you will come and give them an official welcome to the church uh, following the worship service. Glad to have the Harris family. Other than celebrating the Moors and the Harrises, uh, we, have, uh, we celebrate a birth in the church. William Joseph Johnson was born uh, this past Wednesday to Daniel and Creasy Johnson. Nice two babies born, been named Johnson. Uh, and a growing list of concerns to uh, share with you this morning. Marie Pulley was taken to the emergency department at Rex on Friday. Uh, she's uh, awaiting some procedure on some clogged arteries, I think. Bill Baker is at Rex. Robert Coiner was discharged from Rex yesterday. Elizabeth Elliott is at Blue Ridge Healthcare recuperating from a stroke. She has been living at Magnolia Glen. Jack Clark is back at Springmore convalescing in their health center after breaking his hip. He didn't make the announcements last week, but Phil Kramer is getting some repair work done on a detached retina caused by a ricocheting tennis ball. As I said, all that fitness stuff can be bad for your health sometimes. You know? <laughs> Jim Rayner told me this morning Ed Stock is going in for a pacemaker uh, sometime soon. And uh, Madeline McFadden is uh, getting ready to have knee replacement done uh, tomorrow at Rex. Her doctor is Dr. Chavetta, who has a long, strong connection with our church. And he'll be doing the surgery, and then an hour and a half later, he's doing the same procedure on Madeline's sister. And I talked with Dot Hoover this morning. Uh, she's recovering from that procedure on her back that was supposed to reduce pain. Uh, so far, that's just theory. But uh, her birthday is next Sunday, by the way. Same age as the number of keys on a piano. In fact, Dot told me she was born the year that Presbyterian women uh, started in our church. So, uh, we wish her well at home. Dot Hoover. Um, the Book of Psalms is the Bible's prayer book or hymn book, and I've modeled today's prayer on Psalm 46, which will be read from the Bible as Scripture immediately following. I borrowed some from the New Revised Standard Version, the Message, and some other translations. So uh, let us join together now in a time of prayer. Great God, you are our safe place. You live here. You live here where you planted flowers and trees over all the earth. Oh God, you are marvelous. Even though there's warring and fighting all around us, you would break our weapons across your knee. You would have us live in harmony and in peace. Indeed, we could find peace with you, O God, our refuge and strength, always a very present help in time of trouble. When we really trust in you, we can stay calm even when the earth shakes, waves are crashing, and the whole world seems in tumult. You are with us. You, O oh God, are our safe place. You live here. A mighty fortress is our God. Lord, help us to be still, to be quiet, to pause in Sabbath time to contemplate your love and grace, your power and majesty, which transcends any human language. Lord, help us pause, center on you, and know that you are God. You are our God. 
our safe place. You live here. May the Spirit of Christ, your Son, our Savior, be among us as we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are children who'd like to come down and join me on the steps. Not today. So after this, you'll just have to head on back to your seats. I'm glad to see so many of you here. You know, when the grown-ups all stand up, it's hard for us to see how many children are out there. So I'm glad to have a chance to see you together this morning. Were you paying attention a few minutes ago when a nice young lady right over here stood up and sang a song all by herself? Had you ever heard that song before? It's called Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Have some of you heard that before? It's a, it's a, hymn, it's a hymn that's pretty popular. A lot of people would say it's their favorite church hymn. It's been around a long time. I think it was written uh, about 230 years ago. That's a long time ago. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about the person who wrote the hymn. His name was John Newton. Okay, I don't expect you to remember all this, but the thing to remember about John Newton is before he wrote that hymn, he was not a very nice person. Jo John Newton was actually kind of a, a bad guy. Uh, you know, Jesus said we're supposed to do two things. We're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love each other. Well, I'm not sure John Newton did either of those things. I don't think he thought much about God, and I know he didn't think much about other people. He, just, he was just not a very nice guy. But one day, he heard something that changed everything for him. He learned that God loved him. Even though he didn't think much about God and didn't, didn't, didn't try to love God, he learned and began to believe that God loved him. And that changed him. It changed who he was. And he decided, if God loves me, I need to try to love God back. And, and so he went from being a pretty bad guy to being a kind of person who writes a hymn called Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. You can actually hear a little bit of his story because as that song goes on, it says, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Have you ever heard anybody called a wretch? Even if you've never heard that before, that doesn't sound good, does it? You can almost tell by the word that that's not a very nice thing to be as a wretch. Well, he wrote that hymn to say that God loved him even when he wasn't very lovable. And it helped, and, God, and, and knowing that God loved him helped him to be a better person. Now as I look out at you, I don't see any of you are wretches. You seem like pretty nice people. And I try to be a pretty nice person. We all try to be pretty nice people. But what that story tells me is that if God's love can change John Newton from a wretch to a really pretty nice person who did love God and love his neighbor, 
I think God can keep on working on us, even though we're pretty nice people, God can help us grow more and more to be the way he wants us to be. And of course, the way he wants us to be is to be people who try to follow what Jesus does. And what Jesus did was love God and loved everyone else. And that's what we want. That's what I want to do. And that's what we want you to do too. Can you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for amazing grace, for changing John Newton and changing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming down to see me. Y'all can head on back and sit in your seats. Let us pray for illumination, please. Lord, Help us to be still this morning as we listen for your voice. Illumine the reading of your holy word so that we may hear what you want us to hear and in turn would live as you would have us to live. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is found from the much beloved book of Psalms, the 46th chapter, and it's found on page 517. Listen now for the word of God. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From the book of Psalms, we turn now to the New Testament, to Luke's record of the Gospel, the 10th chapter. Our reading begins at the 38th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your spirit upon us as we gather ourselves around these ancient texts. Give us the gift of your light that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
based on the unscientific observation of the guys in my neighborhood where I grew up. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who like to mess with hornet's nests, and then there are those who don't. There are people who see hornet's nests or wasp's nests, and they just have to get a stick and mess with it. They seem compelled to want to jostle it enough to cause a disturbance just to see what will happen. And then there are those who like to leave things be, who would rather walk quietly by a hornet's nest, not wanting to unnecessarily agitate it. Well, I don't know which camp you're in, but I'm in the second. I tend to leave hornet's nests alone, choosing not to create a furor when there is no need for a furor. For that reason, I tend to avoid preaching on the gospel text for today. For a preacher, this text is fraught with peril. For almost more than almost any text in the Bible, this text has the capacity to create division among women. And no preacher in his or her right mind wants to create division among women. Think about it. At first glance, Jesus here seems to be suggesting that those who sit and pray and worship are somehow to be favored over those who toil away in the kitchen. That those who sit and pray and worship are to be favored over those who get their hands dirty doing the unglamorous but necessary work of tending to the physical needs of the community. And in every church, there are people, not just women, but people who are inclined to one thing or the other. Some are more inclined to the spiritual realm, more inclined to study and prayer and reflection, while there are others who are more inclined to be the doers, the worker bees, back in the kitchen or out in the flower beds. And the last thing a preacher wants to do is pit these groups against each other and to suggest that one way of rendering service is more important than the other, or to suggest that one way of offering service to Jesus is more worthy than the other. And so this text is a problem, at least on the surface, because Jesus seems to be making that point. And so every few years when this text bubbles up in one of the readings of the day, I have more often than not preached on another text. Because remember, I'm one of those guys who leaves hornet's nests alone. But one of the helpful things about the discipline of the lectionary is that it sometimes makes you address texts you'd rather avoid. So today, I had a week off to think about it. We're going to take a look at this text and hopefully move beyond the surface where it seems so simple and seek a deeper truth underneath. Because what I've learned in a lifetime of studying the teachings of Jesus, there is always a deeper truth underneath. So again, the story goes like this. Jesus comes to the home of his good friends, Mary and Martha. Upon his arrival, Martha, adhering to the Middle Eastern value of hospitality, heads to the kitchen to prepare a meal, while Mary takes a seat at Jesus' feet so she could hear whatever he might have to say. At some point, it got to Martha that she was toiling away while everybody else is in the front room. And so she went and asked Jesus to tell Mary to get up and get busy. But instead, Jesus suggested that maybe it was Martha who should rethink where she was spending the day. That instead of being consumed with a long list of things to do, Maybe this day would have been better spent at Jesus' feet. Now I know what some of you are thinking, especially those of you who are wired the same way Martha is wired. What you are thinking is, is that if everybody's in the living room with Jesus, there's not going to be any lunch. <laughs> lunch isn't going to make itself. 
Somebody's got to get in there and make it. Which is a very good point. It's hard to argue with that point. But Jesus seems to be making another point. And maybe the point Jesus is making is that feeding him is not nearly as important as allowing him to feed you. There's nothing in the text to suggest that Jesus was hungry. There's nothing in the text to suggest that Jesus was expecting a meal. What he came expecting to do, it seems, was to teach. And what he wanted more than lunch were listeners. One of the voices I miss in the Christian landscape is that of John Claypool. You may not know John Claypool. He was a Baptist preacher who for about 30 years and then he switched teams and for the last 10 years or so of his ministry, he was an Episcopal priest. I don't know exactly how he pulled that off. But he served the final years of his ministry as a priest in an Episcopal church in Birmingham, Alabama. He was also a widely published author, which is how I met him. And since he died a few years ago, I've begun to miss his voice. He was a wonderfully insightful interpreter of texts and had a keen way of assessing the human condition. And I loved the way he looked at this Mary and Martha text. He said that he came to understand this story in a new way as he attended a big, grandiose birthday party that a woman had prepared for her husband. She knew he would never approve of this kind of party, so he wasn't big on surprise parties or parties at all, so she had to make it a surprise. For weeks, she was consumed by every detail of this thing. The invitations, making sure that everybody kept it a secret, the caterers, the decorators, the plan to keep him out of the house for one full day so that all the last-minute details could be choreographed so that when he came home, he'd be surprised by a house filled with friends and acquaintances Food everywhere, music and decorations galore. It was just the sort of party his wife loved. And so she was in her element. She loved the clamor and the crowd. But it was just the sort of party he hated. <laughs> and so 15 minutes into it, he could be found in an out-of-the-way corner with two or three of his closest friends enjoying quiet conversation. All of which caused John Claypool to take another look at this text and to come up with what he began to call the platinum rule. Now you know about the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a great guide for living, inviting us to treat others the way we'd like to be treated. But sometimes, Dr. Claypool suggested, we need a slight variation of that rule so, so that instead of treating others the way we'd like to be treated, we treat others the way they'd like to be treated. The woman who threw that party for her husband threw the party that she'd like to have. It was her kind of party. But it wasn't his kind of party. She treated him the way she'd like to be treated, not the way he'd like to be treated. You see the difference? And this caused John Claypool to wonder whether Martha jumped up when Jesus arrived because she would hope someone would do that for her. And so she was treating Jesus the way she would want to be treated rather than treating Jesus the way Jesus wanted to be treated. And sometimes there's a difference. You see, Jesus made it clear he came into the world not to be served but to serve. He came so, not so that others would tend to him but that he could tend to them. Mary seemed to know that. She seemed to know that as long as Jesus was in this room, she wasn't going to leave because she didn't want to miss a word he had to say. And so maybe this whole discipleship thing is a balancing act. 
You wouldn't want to take this story from today and make the assumption that Jesus was a big fan of idleness because the text you looked at last week with Sheila, the, Jesus celebrated the neighborliness of the Good Samaritan and that story was filled with action words. He saw a person, he stopped, he bandaged, he poured, he put him on his donkey, he brought him to the inn, he took care of him. It's a story filled with acting and doing. It's a story filled with busyness as the good Samaritan tended to a neighbor in need. So it's obvious that sometimes faithfulness demands action and activity. Sometimes faithfulness demands that we busy ourselves with deeds of service and compassion and charity. Habitat houses don't get built by people who sit around and pray for the poor. Meals on Wheels don't get delivered by people who sit around and study the statistics of the, the elder, elderly who are hungry. And the rooms over in the stock building don't get set up for our Wynn families by people who meditate on the issues of homelessness. Sometimes faithfulness demands hands-on activity and busyness. But sometimes faithfulness invites us to be still and to know that God is God. To be still and to drink from the life-giving fountain of God's love. To be still and to celebrate the fact that in the person of Jesus Christ, God has come near to you with a life-changing, reorienting gospel. Sometimes faithfulness invites us to sit, to listen, and to learn. And so maybe a part of our maturing as disciples is to know when to do one and when to do the other. And perhaps the best rule of thumb is this, when we notice hunger in the world, it's time for us to get active, it's time for us to get into the kitchen, it's time for us to actively tend to the hungers that plague our neighbors. But when we notice a hunger in ourselves, well then it's a time for us to sit and to partake of the only nourishment available to us that reaches all the way into our soul. This is not a choice between being busy and not being busy. For it dawned on me this week that there are two kinds of busy. Let me use a simple analogy to help you understand what I mean by that. We have a tree in our yard and in that tree there is a bird's nest. Now a bird's nest is a busy place. First of all, there's all the busyness of its construction as the birds went back and forth and back and forth with twigs and grass and straw and odd pieces of paper to put that nest together. And then when the nest was completed and the eggs were hatched, the busyness continues going out to get food for the baby birds, bringing it to them, going out again, bringing it back, almost constant motion. And then there's the, the busyness of, of nudging the baby birds out into the world. So the bird's nest is a busy place. Certain things have to get done. But the tree just sits there, or so it seems. But if we could look closer, we would see that the tree is pretty busy too, with roots reaching down deeper into the earth, drawing nourishment from the water and the soil and then distributing that nourishment to the far reaches of the branches. And then there are the leaves doing their work, taking in sunlight. If we could look at that tree from a cellular level, we'd see that it is pretty busy. Even though from our perspective, it looks like it's just 
sitting there. Just because Mary is not in the kitchen doesn't mean she's not busy. Like a tree drawing its nourishment, like a tree drawing in light, Mary is busy. She is busy taking in what she needs to live. She is busy taking in what she needs to foster a spirit of hope in her heart. It might not look like she's busy, but she's busy. And so here in this text, Jesus is inviting Martha to that kind of busyness. There will be other moments where her kind of busyness is vitally important, for the world is filled with hunger. There will always be people needing to be fed. But among the people who need to be fed is Martha. And no one can feed Martha the way Jesus can. And so these two stories from the Gospel of Luke, back to back, one week after another, the Good Samaritan story and the story of Mary and Martha, suggest to me how very important it is to live with an awareness of hunger. To live with an awareness of the hunger in the world so that we can attend to it but also to live with an awareness of the hunger in our own souls so that we can attend to that too. So let's stay busy. Sometimes in the kitchen, preparing bread to take out into a hungry world, but also at the feet of Jesus, who, after all, is the very bread of life. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. God has fed us with many blessings, and as we have actively listened to his word, we now actively respond to it as we present our morning tithes and offerings.
Dear Lord, we've actively listened to your word and we respond in action with these gifts. Lord, prosper the work of our hands as we use them to follow the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The rhythm of Christian discipleship seems to be sit and listen, go and do. Sit and listen, go and do. Sit in the presence of Christ, draw the light that he came to give, and then go out into the world and share that light with the world that needs it. Sit and listen, go and do, to do one or the other is to live an imbalanced life. But to do both is to reflect the life to which we've been called by the Christ who called us to love God, to love neighbor. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune mercy of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, with those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.